It's important in A2 that we also think about supply side policies. Um, and these are very interesting policies because they combine micro and macro effects. Um, so it's a really good way of demonstrating evaluation and your ability to draw um, micro, mi micro and macro concepts together into the same answer. Um, when you're doing it, there's two main ways that we think about supply side policy. The first one of those are supply side policies which influence the labour market. Um, and these are generally either to improve the quantity of labour, which means actually increasing the amount of uh, workers um, in the workforce, or the quality of labour, which is obviously improving their skills and ultimately their productivity. Um, the other main element that we also need to consider is supply-side policies which may target the product market. And here we are essentially talking about the role of competition and efficiency, okay, and especially dynamic efficiency, which is obviously something that we've looked at in our micro studies so far this term. The final important thing to note about these is that they are very much uh, a neoclassical viewpoint. So supply side policies um, became very popular, um, particularly in the 80s, um, with Margaret Thatcher in the UK and Ronald Reagan in America, um, who adopted very much a neoclassical viewpoint. Um, they, in, in many ways, they, uh, they, they are kind of the, the opposite end of the extreme to the very Keynesian uh, policies, which are obviously very much aggregate demand side focused. So we'll consider the labour market first and we'll have a look at policies which um, a government might seek to adopt in order to improve either the quantity or the quality of the labour force. Um, now, according to the scheme of work, um, the specifications for AQA, there are four that, uh, that you need to know about. One is a reduction in income tax. You also need to know about a reduction in welfare or benefits, to put it another way. Third one is education and training. And the last of the four is trade union reform. And these are four different types of um, macro policy uh, that the government can adopt, um, although several of them will have um, micro elements to them as well. Trade union reform especially um, is, is something where actually we consider trade unions very much in a micro context. But we're just going to very quickly move through each of these um, and explain how they would be used in order to increase the level of aggregate supply, but also to think about um, the extent to which they're likely to be successful and how we would actually evaluate these in an answer. So one of the main supply side policies that the government can adopt, uh, and this one obviously overlaps very much with the fiscal policy that we've already looked at, is they can aim to reduce income tax rates and provide incentive for people to go into work. So the analysis chain will go something like this. So the reduction in income tax rates will increase the incentive to work. This very simply is because people will get to keep more of the income which, uh, which they generate as a result of that work. On the one hand, there may well be people who have made a decision for whatever reason that they didn't want to work. Um, maybe they were staying at home looking after the family or something like that. But the option to keep more of their earned income may well mean that they decide to re-enter the workforce. And another effect that uh, may also occur here is that those people who are earning uh, benefits may decide that actually now the fact that they can keep more of their earned income may actually incentivize them to return to work. So um, one of the policies that, uh, that the coalition government has made a big play on is the increase in the, um, in, uh, the personal allowance for income tax, the amount that you're allowed to earn before you start paying any income tax at all. Obviously that's reducing the income tax rate to zero for those first, um, as I make this video, ten and a half thousand pounds that you earn. So 
that's obviously going to provide an incentive for those people who were previously living on benefits to re-enter the workforce. But we're going to talk a little bit more about benefits um, in the, the next slide. The impact of both of these effects then will be to increase the size of the workforce and this will then increase the amount of factor production available within the economy and therefore achieve the desired effect of increasing long-run aggregate supply. Now when we have an analysis chain like that we know that what we need to do is consider the links which are in the chain and consider whether they are always going to hold, whether they're factually uh, certain or whether there are certain factors which may influence the strength of the link or may perhaps even mean that it doesn't hold at all. Now I think um, when we look at this the first one reduction in income tax rates leading to an increased incentive to work I think virtually all economists be they classical or Keynesian would argue that if you give people the opportunity of keeping more of their earned income that's going to increase the incentive to work. Similarly we know that um, an increase in the size of the workforce, all other things being equal, will increase the long-run aggregate supply, getting those additional workers in, um, even if they don't necessarily add anything in terms of skills, um, they enable the economy to produce more. So the, the first and last links there are uh, kind of relatively certain. But the ones that we need to think about then are these ones in the middle. Um, and we need to think about essentially the extent to which increasing this incentive is actually going to have the desired effect in terms of encouraging people to enter the labour force. So um, as I said before I'm going to worry about the unemployment trap, the, the kind of the right hand side avenue a little bit more later on but let's think about the, the left hand one where um, people that were previously deciding not to work will enter the, the, the workforce. I think the main thing that we need to think about here is are they not working on the basis of earnings and what I mean by that is when we consider these people that um, that have chosen for whatever reason not to be in the workforce is that in any way a decision based on earnings because if it's not based on earnings then actually the fact that they keep more of their earned income is likely to have much less of an effect um, so we, we need to question that that that's not necessarily going to hold true um, and we also need to think about the extent to which this is actually going to happen um, in terms of which income tax rates do we alter. Um, and kind of one of the things that we need to think about here is the relationship between the income tax rate that people have to pay and the amount that they earn. And there's a, a, a tool developed by a, a chap called Arthur Laffer, um, the, the Laffer Curve, which we're going to have a look at on the next slide, which aims to look at this relationship between um, the incentive to work and the, the tax rate. So this is the Laffer Curve. Um, there are a couple of ways of seeing it drawn. The um, AQA textbook and mark schemes generally draw it like this where you have revenues on the horizontal and rates on the vertical axis um, but you may well also come across it just so you're aware um, being drawn the other way around so being drawn with revenue on the vertical and rates on the horizontal in which case it has that sort of a shape um, either way it's basically demonstrating the same thing so um, you don't need to worry about which one you uh, which one you you do um, it's just uh, it's just a case of convention really and uh, as I say the AQA board um, generally seems to prefer the uh, the one where it, the, the bulge is kind of horizontal really um, but we've got three points here labeled one two and three um, so let's just think about what's going on um, in each of those points so at point one uh, which just kind of clarifies down here um, so at point one down here okay the tax rate is zero percent and obviously if the tax rate is zero percent then that means that there will be no revenue. If no income is taxed, then there will be no revenue. That's quite obvious. Um, point two, which is the other end of the line, so point two is up here. Um, what's going on there is that 
tax is at 100%. So the marginal rate of tax is at 100%. What that means is that if you earn one more pound, then the whole of that pound gets taken by the government in the form of tax. And the Laffer curve would argue that under those circumstances, the incentive to work is removed entirely. And as a result of that, nobody will choose to work and the government will also receive zero revenue um, under those circumstances as well. And that leaves us with the third point here. Um, and the third point... Oh, let's get a pen back. The third point is where we have some level of tax which balances out this uh, the amount that people are paying with the incentive effect. And this is the revenue maximizing level of tax. Okay, and uh, it's labeled on the diagram as C. So C over here is the tax rate which generates the largest amount of tax revenue. So what we've got in areas A and B, in area B we've got um, the increase in revenue effect is greater than the disincentive effect. Once we go above tax rate C though, and we then move into the kind of the, the section of the curve labeled A, what's going on there is although uh, the government is receiving a higher marginal rate of tax, the disincentive effects are starting to be starting to become more powerful and as a result of that, as they increase the tax rate further and further still, um, the this is incentive effect becomes stronger and stronger and stronger until we reach point two at the top there where nobody is wanting to do some work. Now the the really key issue with the Laffer curve, um, and it's one of the most disputed um, theories in, in economics is this issue um, and essentially the, the issue around the Laffer curve is what is C? What, what is the rate of tax that maximizes government revenue? Um, a number of people have tried to um, come up with some kind of theoretical proof uh, using various analyses and so on. Um, there have been a number of figures proposed um, from flat rate taxes in the kind of the 20 percent ish kind of territory all the way up. Um, and some economists argue that you can get well up to kind of towards 60, 70, sometimes even 80 percent, according to some analysis, before these um, disincentive effects kick in. So huge debate about um, the extent to which um, there is kind of a, a single identifiable, part, identifiable point. This curve seems to suggest that um, the, the, the optimal tax rate would be something around 50%, but, but that's, that's definitely not um, universally agreed. Um, some people will argue that um, the optimal rate is much lower, in which case they would generate a curve that looks like that. So the optimal rate of tax would be much lower down here. Um, some people would argue that you can have a much higher tax rate before the disincentive effects kick in, which would lead to a Laffer curve that looked more like this, where you could have a, a much higher uh, tax rate um, before the disincentive effects started to kick in. So um, a huge amount of disagreement, as you would expect. Um, classical and neoclassical economists tend to think that the optimal tax rate is down there somewhere, and the more Keynesian socialist economists would um, would argue, uh, generally socialists would be higher still than Keynesian, um, but, but Keynesian and socialists would argue that, um, that, that you can increase the, the tax rate uh, to higher levels before these disincentive effects start to kick in. So this raises the kind of the important point in here, I suppose, as far as the supply side theory is concerned. And that, uh, and, and that question is, to what extent would a tax cut increase the incentive to work? And that really is the key issue here um, that, that, that you need to address if you raise this, this issue in, in, an, in an essay. You, you need to think about the extent to which actually it is going to have the effect that, uh, that, that we suppose it might have. So now we're into um, 
some, I suppose, some, some points that have a little bit less theory behind them, some quicker points that you can raise in your answers. If reducing income tax rates are designed to pull people into the labour force, reduction in benefits and welfare is designed to push people into the labour force. So the aim here is very solidly trying to get people off benefits and into work. Um, and it's something that actually the uh, the current coalition government has started to do. They have, for instance, imposed caps on uh, the amount that any individual household can earn before um, uh, in, in terms of their benefits before the, the benefits are, are tapered away or stopped. So uh, the, the, the analysis is, is relatively simple here. And, and as you would expect, the key thing to think about here is what's called the unemployment trap. OK, and the unemployment trap is a situation where it is financially preferable to live on benefits than to seek work. OK, and um, there are basically, as you would imagine, two reasons for this. One is that uh, benefits are too high or alternatively wages are too low to attract people into the labour force. Now the wages too low idea, um, the government can deal with that in a couple of ways. Um, income tax, as we've talked about in, uh, in a previous point. Also, some economists would argue that um, a minimum wage could also work here. Now you'd obviously have to balance that off against the costs to the business of having to do that, but certainly a minimum wage might work to attract uh, attract workers into those those low paid jobs that otherwise they might decide are 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 too low paid for them to do. Um, this one though, reduction in benefits welfare. Um, very simply, the the aim of this is to reduce the um, level of primarily the job seekers allowance uh, that being the the benefit that you get whilst looking for a job so the idea being that if you reduce the job seekers allowance um, people will spend uh, less time hunting for a job before they accept one because um, in order to maintain reasonable living standards they need to take a job so uh, the argument here goes that uh, a reduction in benefits and again we are talking here about incentives the reduction in benefits incentivizes people to um, enter the workforce because it, it, it pushes them into, into work where hopefully they can earn a higher wage. So the next sort of policy, um, one of the very, very commonly cited policies uh, that the government can adopt to influence the labour market is education and training. The important thing to remember here is that this is to do with the quality of the workers rather than the quantity. The factors that we've considered so far, the reduction in income tax rates and the reduction in benefits, both of those aimed to simply increase the number of workers um, and to try and increase long run aggregate supply that way. Education and training is slightly different in that it focuses on improving the skills of the workers which there are already um, which already exist within the economy. So it's a quality rather than a quantity thing. But the key thing here, and, and the word that you must include in any answer along these kind of lines, is productivity. The intention here is to increase the amount that a single unit of labour, i.e. an individual person, can produce. If an economy can do that, then that will increase the long-run aggregate supply. It will increase the productive capacity of the economy. So, so, so kind of the... Analysis chain goes along the lines of education and training will lead to more highly skilled population a more highly skilled in uh, population will be more productive which will mean and that there is an increase in productive capacity which will increase long-run aggregate supply. And if we think about uh, that in the same way as we have before in terms of whether they will hold or not, um, will an education increase the skill level within the population? 
Yes, it probably will. Um, a much more important question, though, is regarding the next link. Does a skilled population make the economy more productive? And here, it depends on the skills being taught, the skills being trained, because it may well be that those skills don't necessarily contribute to um, workers becoming more productive. Um, for a while in, in universities, there was a phase that they went through where you could kind of take David Beckham's studies or so, those sorts of things, things that don't actually really contribute very much to the development of an economy. So more realistically, I suppose, you, you need to challenge this on the basis of whether the skills that people are being trained in are current and useful in terms of actually improving the capacity of the economy right now. One of the criticisms that you can level at, um, at any education system, uh, British one, no exception to that, is whether or not it is actually delivering skills which are useful in terms of um, generating a more productive workforce. You can argue whether we should be focusing more on collaborative skills, we should be focusing more on technology skills rather than uh, kind of your traditional classroom model. Um, would it then be true that if workers are more productive that will increase the productive capacity of the economy? Um, it will, although one of the other things that we have to think about on this one is the time lag. Um, it obviously takes quite some time to work through this analysis chain and actually delivering the skills and having those turn into productive uh, contributions to the economy. If we think about education, you know, we're talking uh, you know, kind of five, 10, 15 years maybe before those people that are in school go off and, and start contributing to the economy. Does an increase in productive capacity increase the long run aggregate supply, all other things being equal? Yes, it does. So again, they're um, a relatively simple analysis chain, but one where you can definitely pick on a couple of links and develop some really good evaluation in there. So the last one of the labour market policies that we're going to look at is trade union reform. Um, this means weakening the power of trade unions. And the argument that's put forward is that this will increase the flexibility of the labour market. We do, though, need to put a very big question mark at the end of that. Um, there's a lot of dispute about trade unions and whether they play a beneficial role in an economy or not, whether actually the labour market would function better without them and so on. Um, whatever your view on it, you need to make a balanced argument in your answer. So I'm going to take you through the line of argument here that says that um, reducing the power of trade unions does improve long run aggregate supply because that's what we're looking at, supply side policies. But uh, we will also look at some evaluation here um, about the ways in which this may not necessarily benefit long run aggregate supply. We are going to look at trade unions a lot more um, later on in the year, so I'm not going to spend too long looking at it now. And the basic line of argument here says that if the unions are weaker, then that will mean that there is less negotiating power for the workers within that particular industry. If we're following the classical economics uh, line of argument that, uh, that says that abolishing trade unions can benefit the economy, then we can say that the fact that workers have less negotiating power makes it easier for firms to hire and fire the staff. The argument then continues to say that this will generate a more flexible and responsive labour market because businesses will be able to hire people when they need them, when uh, the economy is growing quickly, but that when the economy slows down, they are able to respond to that immediately by reducing the amount of workers that they employ. And then the analysis continues that if the labour market is more responsive, um, and that firms are able to react and be flexible, then the labour resources within the economy are going to be used more effectively. They're going to be redirected to the areas of the economy where there's growth. Um, and that that will mean that actually by moving them into those more productive areas, the economy will benefit and we will get our increase in long run aggregate supply. So let's go through as we have done before and think about whether or not these things will actually hold. Does a weaker trade union mean less negotiating power for the workers? Yes, it does, by definition. Do Does the fact that there's less negotiating power for workers mean that it's easier for firms to hire and fire the workforce? Um, probably. Yes, it does. Um, although it still does depend on 
the relative position of uh, of the firms. Um, in some markets, the, the the firms may still not be powerful enough um, to 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 hire and fire at will, um, and there are other you know kind of various contractual obligations and so on that may make it hard for them to do that. But it it probably will. If it's easier for firms to hire and fire, does that make the labour market more flexible? Um, yes, it does. The main question, though, the main evaluation here is on this one. Does a more flexible and responsive labour market mean that labour resources are being used more efficiently? Um, if you are going to go with the classical model, then you are assuming that labour is mobile. OK, and what we mean by that is that... it's able to respond and it's able to move from profession to profession and from region to region um, without too much difficulty. And obviously, if we're going to say that this responsive labour market is actually beneficial, it means that people need to be able to move into other professions and so on. Um, the danger, of course, is here um, and, and the sort of thing that, that more uh, left leaning economic viewpoints would suggest is that actually they would say that labour is not mobile it doesn't have this degree of mobility and therefore actually when you make it easier for the firms to hire and fire as we have done earlier on that actually the problem there is that you generate um, structural unemployment that that people are made redundant because they are no longer needed in a particular industry but they don't have the correct skills and so on to move into a new industry so actually then the argument here is that um rather than actually making a more flexible labour market, you have actually damaged the labour market by generating structural unemployment, which we know is a serious form of unemployment, um, and can also lead to um, people becoming ever more detached from the skills required to enter the labour force. If, though, we assume that it does hold for the moment, we take the more classical view and we say that this does work, um, would a more efficient use of labour resources increase long-run aggregate supply? All other things being equal, yes, it would. So here, um, as with a lot of the other ones, um, a lot of dispute and a lot of that dispute focused on that one link in the middle there, whether a flexible and responsive labour market actually benefits um, the overall functioning of the labour market by making it more ref, uh, responsive, more flexible, more adaptable, uh, more able to deal with external shocks and so on, or whether actually by making it easier for firms to hire and fire workers, you are essentially giving them the power to exploit workers and the end result of that could be um, structural unemployment. So this presentation, a rather lengthy one, but what we've dealt with there is four really significant ways that the government can uh, get involved in the labour market to try and increase the level of long run aggregate supply within the economy. These primarily are classical um, and neoclassical viewpoints. Um, as we said at the start, supply side uh, policies really uh, very much coincide with uh, classical and neoclassical viewpoints. And you've got to remember that and then use the uh, primarily the Keynesian viewpoint to criticise this.